I know that pornography is not an easy topic to talk about, but we've got to say something. Uh, it is a silent killer. In 20-something years of pastoral ministry at the village, I've seen it destroy families, marriages. Uh, I've seen it hold back the potential of men and women because of shame. Maybe you've experienced this in your own life or you've seen it in the life of another. So what I wanna do is I wanna give you 30 free days uh, of Covenant Eyes. And, and the best way to go about doing that is go to covenanteyes.com and, and use OVERCOMERS in all caps. And that's 30 days free for you to test drive what I think is the most effective to hinder access to pornography and come alongside a, a man or woman struggling with this a, in a way that you can feel supported and encouraged in the fight. Again, you can go to covenanteyes.com, all caps, overcomers, or you can just click the link in the show notes. close to 30 years now, I have had the privilege of preaching and teaching God's Word in all sorts of different locations, in front of different crowds, and it's been one of the great joys of my life to study the Word of God and try to mine it for all that's there. Um, that used to involve, you know, having 20 books open on a big table with a spiral notebook and and, and a thousand other little helps with a BDAG. And um, about 15 years ago, that began to change for me as I began to migrate over from everything being paper to using Logos Bible Study software. Uh, I, I learned what it would take me two hours to do uh, on, in, in books and paper. I could, I could handle in, in sometimes seconds. So if you're a student of God's Word, whether you're a preacher or not, I cannot commend Logos to you more fervently. It, it has been a lifesaver. Uh, in the ministry for me as I preach week in and week out, sometimes more than once a week. Uh, I feel um, prepared and, and capable because of the ease and the speed at which Logos brings to the scriptures. If you're interested in that, you can go to logos.com backslash overcomers. There's a discount waiting for you there. And, and I wanna encourage you, this can take your Bible study to a whole new level. Well, hey, welcome back to a, a, an actual bonus episode of The Overcomers. Uh, and I get the privilege today uh, to talk with a man who, in the formative years of my Christian faith, was the the guy I was reading, and and if he wrote a book, I snatched it up. I mean, I uh, maybe you saw this on Instagram, but I have a very vivid memory of getting to the end of the applause of heaven late at night, uh, maybe early in the morning is a better way to describe it, and having like wrestling with um, my flesh in that season. You know, I'd become a Christian. I thought everything would get easier. I was stumbling in in ways that I it just started believing maybe I wasn't even a Christian. And uh, I loved Jesus deeply, but I didn't quite understand why I kept getting myself into these jams. And then I get to those last two paragraphs of the applause of heaven. I just remember just nearly uncontrollably weeping at mm. the love of God for me. And so Max Lucado became a voice uh, in my life early on, helped me understand grace a bit better, helped me know to run to the Lord and not from the Lord when I was bumbling and stumbling. And man, that has served um, as like a foundational reality that I've been living into now for 32 years, that you run to him, you don't run from him. Uh, you, you don't hide, you, you run straight to him. And so I owe Max Lucado that I'm so glad to chat with him today. And so Max, welcome to the overcomers. Matt, it is my honor. It is my honor. And I just hold you in such high regard. I feel a connection with you that makes me think we've had a dozen conversations over long <laughs> meals or yeah. but we really haven't it's just no. that immediate connection uh, and um, i've shared with you before the deep appreciation i have for 
the days that you taught a Bible class, or a, really it was a, not just a Bible class, it was a large worship service in Abilene, Texas, of all places. Let's and go. my daughter was a student there at Abilene Christian University, and she attended your Bible teaching every Tuesday night. And so did my son-in-law. And uh, even though he wasn't uh, a student, he made trips to Abilene quite often That's uh, when he and my daughter were dating and they would attend. And so <laughs> uh, they they both told me to tell you thank you. They oh, told I love me to that. Tell you thank you. I That's, love that. Uh, and listen, I absolutely loved my time in Abilene. I loved it. I sometimes I find myself missing the sunset out there. Yeah, um, yeah. The too many trees here for me to see it well. <laughs> but man, out there was stunning and such great people. Now let me because if you're if you tune into these episodes, you know, kind of a rule is usually no blue check, no well known people, just everyday Christians, kind of long journey home, walking through trials. And so I thought one of the things that could be fun today with Max, even though fun is probably the wrong word. Um, is I I think one of the things that can happen to people is when they think of pastors, when they think of guys like me or Max or your pastor, or they, they tend to wrongly believe that we're more than human and, and that some of the things that can affect all Christians we're somehow exempt from. Uh, and so when I'm talking about overcoming and I'm talking about sanctification, not being up and to the right, that I think that lays across all of us and, and pastors uniquely experience these seasons too, because in the midst of difficulty, they, they still are going to stand up and herald the word of God. They're still going to try to lead with convictional courage and confidence, even when maybe everything at home or everything in their body or uh, everything in their circumstances are, are maybe even crushing. Uh, they're having to really trust that the Lord would work in that weakness. And so, um, Max, we, we haven't debriefed any of this, so I don't have some script to go off of, but can you talk about maybe a season or two in your own journey? How, how long you been in ministry now? Gosh, I was reading you when I was 19. I turned 50 in June. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I began ministry in 1979. Um, I'm almost 70. I'm all my next birthday cake will require 70 candles. That's, That's amazing. For some reason, that has struck me. At, at, at the age fifty and sixty, didn't seem to be um, not, and again, not in a negative way. Really, an exciting way. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about um, what the Lord has in store for me after I die. I'm, I'm just fascinated by it. I'm insatiably curious about it. Uh, I've read and read and thought and thought and prayed and prayed and. I I empathize with somebody who who doesn't want to die because they feel like they're running out of time. They want to get everything done. Before. I'm yeah. just the opposite. I, I I'm not looking forward to the death necessarily, but yeah. but I really can't wait. I'm just so intrigued by the whole promise. Jesus has helped has blessed me so much in a world of sin. Yeah. I cannot imagine what it's going to be like in a world <laughs> where there is no sin. Yeah, Amen. Can you, no lust, no lies, no greed, you know, no second thoughts, no regrets, none of that. It's going to be extraordinary. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, yeah, so I'm I'm almost 70. I went into the ministry in 1979. Um I, I was a I was a a real drunk. You know, my dad, I think we may have talked before. I I went to Abilene Christian University because that's where my dad said that he would uh help pay the tuition. Because I was I was a six pack a night guy in high school, and he he knew if I went to my choice was Texas Tech. You said you were headed to A and M, I was heading to Texas Tech, and all my drinking buddies were going there too. And he said you're not going there, and if you go there, you're on your own. But if you'll go to Abilene Christian, uh, which was required daily Bible classes, yeah, he hoped that would help. Well, by the time I was a sophomore in college at the age of twenty, it had helped, and. Um, and and when that preacher preached that sermon on grace that March morning of my spring semester, you couldn't have held me back. Yeah. I was I was if God would forgive a jerk like me. <laughs> so that's how my my walk with Christ began. I ended up staying in Abilene and and going to the seminary there or grad school, to Abilene Christian, 
And uh, I wanted to be a missionary, and so I ended up in South America. I lived there for much of the 80s. My wife and I did, and married a wonderful, wonderful woman. Our two of our three daughters were born in Brazil. We lived in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, to answer your question about tough times, I'm headed toward that yeah. answer. So while I'm in Brazil, that's when I started writing books, Matt. And um, uh, I had I had a, obviously got one published, and that led to another book published, and that led to another book. So I had three and a half books finished, three books published, half book finished. When, I, when it came time for us to move back to the United States in 1988, I wasn't aware of the notoriety that comes with being an author. I just yeah. wasn't. And being kind of uh, way down there in South America, on the other side of the, of, of, of the globe, across the equator, I, I, I didn't know. I mean, if letters came, they went to the publisher. They didn't come yeah. to me. And uh, I didn't get any speaking invitations. I was way down there. So, so I mean, I, I just knew yeah. I was writing books, and, I, and I, I thought that was a privilege beyond words. So I come back to the States, 1988, and the church in San Antonio provides me an opportunity. And um, within about six or eight months, I'm receiving all these speaking invitations, Matt. And um, I, I start thinking I'm pretty cool. I really did. I mean, I began <laughs> yeah. thinking I'm. I'm. I guess I'm. My ver My generation's Billy Graham. I mean, I start having these terrible thoughts about inflated self, and uh, uh, I began to kind of boast in all the things I was doing. And uh, where where I really messed up was I said yes to everything that came down the pike. Everything. I just thought that was what I was supposed to do. But really down deep, I love the stroke of the ego. Sure. You want me to go preach at your church? If I can, I will. I flew many red-eye flights back in time to preach at, at our church. Well, meanwhile, I've got three daughters, one five, one three, and one in diapers. And I've got my wife, and she's doing her very best to, to wrangle that house. And all she knows is that her husband disappears in the morning and then he goes to either meetings at night or goes to a Bible study at night or he's traveling most weekends. And I had no idea that I was sending my wife over the edge. Yeah. And um, one time I was changing planes in Dallas on my way back to San Antonio. This is probably 1990 now. I had two years of this, of this fa fast-paced uh, ego stroking, traveling all the time. And I called her from Dallas, and I said, honey, I've got this great opportunity. There's this artist uh, uh, that wants to go on a tour, and he wants me to go on a tour with him. I'll be the speaker. He'll be the singer. We're going to travel around. And all of a sudden, I hear sobbing, man, oh. just sobbing. And that's when I find it took that long for this dense brain, for this <laughs> for it to get through, that I was, I was, I was exhausting my wife. So I didn't say anything else. I get on the plane. I come home. I drive to the house. She has successfully got the girls in bed, but my wife, Deanland, is on the floor in a fetal position, just crying. She's got her knees pulled up, and she's just crying. And um, I didn't even know what depression could do with a person, much less that my wife was severely depressed. And uh, I realized I have, I'm, I'm driving our family train over the edge. Yeah. And I've got to get, I've got to change this up. I came that close, Matt. I came yeah. that close to just blowing it all, blowing it all. Had it not been for our wonderful family doctor who immediately saw us the next morning, who referred us to a wonderful psychiatrist who immediately began treating my precious Dean Lynn, uh, with medication and with counseling. Had it not been for the very patient church and my elders who allowed me to confess that and then began to hold me accountable. They began to review my calendar with me every few months. Uh, they began to prohibit me from saying yes okay. to certain things. And so it, it was that close, Matt. It was that close. And uh, if my wife were here, she would tell the story exactly, <laughs> maybe even worse, <laughs> Yeah, uh, because she remembers it well. And that's part of her testimony, part yeah. of her testimony. How long was that season from – you you get home, wife's on in the fetal position. You're mm -hmm. at the doctor. Um, he immediately starts. He sends you to a psychiatrist who's treating 
uh, with with meds and counseling. How, how long's the season until she kind of comes back up? And talk a little bit about the dynamics then at home and church while you're navigating um, the, this despair that she's great, in. Great, great clarification. Yeah, boy, I wish she was right here because she she tells this story so well. <laughs> uh, I would say though it was a full year of okay. recovery, maybe a little longer. It required some drastic decisions. I canceled every speaking engagement. I canceled every single one. I didn't accept another one for quite some time. Um, what she remembers is that, of course, I was still preaching, um, and the church was, uh, you know, Matt, it was a smaller church in those days. We had yeah. one service, and so not nearly as intense as it would become later. But she still, though, I would leave early on Sunday even when I was have, even when I had kind of had my come to Jesus, I, I still needed to leave early on Sunday and left her at home with the three little girls to get ready. And so she remembers being in the church parking lot, and um, a dear, dear lady in our church who's still here of all things, and her husband that. has been an elder all these years. Joy Pruitt, Joy is her name. She saw my wife in the church parking lot and walked up to Deanlin and made a comment like, "Boy." Dragging three kids to church, your that's your penance. Maybe some comment like that. Yeah. And Dean Lynch just began to weep. She yeah. broke down. She broke down because it had been a wild morning. She's trying to get the girls all in their Kate Ashley dresses or whatever sure. we called them back in those <laughs> days. And uh, and she said, and and Joy said to Dean Lynch, if I'm remembering this correctly, Joy said, "You tell everybody you see. You tell everybody you see what's on your heart." And so Dean Lynch did. Okay. Every time somebody would come up to her and say, um, how are you, Dean Lynn? Dean Lynn would say, you know, I'm not doing well at all. Yeah. I'm undone. I'm exhausted. Here's the pastor's wife, right? Yeah. And every person she saw. And what I specifically remember is that she tells me that, she, that later in the day, she has 15 prayer partners. Okay. People who had covenanted. Is that a word? Co- made a it covenant with her yeah. to, to, um, to support her during this difficult, difficult time. And what was so good about that, what, what that taught me is I was still under that assumption that if you're a pastor or a pastor's wife, you've got to have the appearance of having your act sure. together. You can't be honest with the church. It's going to hurt the church. What I learned is the more honest with the church, the more the church loves you in response, and, and, and the more uh, health it is, healthy it is for the church and most of all for her. So she points to that Sunday, Matt, as really the turning point. I can't recall exactly where that was in the process, but I want to say that it was a good 12 to 18 months. That, and she would say she still uh, has to be careful about sure. uh, depression to this yeah. day. And um, it doesn't dog her as it did. And I think her husband's a little more in tune with her than he used to be. <laughs> One of the great themes of the New Testament is this idea of accountability, that you and I would be shield to shield with other brothers and sisters who encourage us, strengthen us, call us to holiness, and support and help us through rebuke and correction when necessary. And and I, I think a great tool for accountability, specifically around uh, sexual purity, uh, around pornography and those things, is the Victory app by Covenant Eyes. Uh, the Victory app has all sorts of features uh, that will be super helpful in your battle for purity, whether you you want help stopping looking at pornography or if you don't ever want to start. Once the Victory app is uploaded to your phone, it's working in the background with kind of cutting edge technology. They've got some AI features that are involved. And, and it's not just like making sure you're not seeing the things on the screen. It, it is uh, looping in allies to support and help you. It, it is uh, recovery material to let you get underneath the compulsion towards pornography. It is ongoing chat and support in a moment where you feel weak and aren't quite sure who to call in or who to ask uh, for help 
in the struggle. Um, and, and here's what I would love to do. I so want you to walk in the victory uh, of sexual purity. Um, that man, I'm, I'm offering through the overcomers 30 days free on this victory app. And so if you go to covenanteyes.com and, and then use overcomers in all caps, it's 30 days free test drive of the Victory app that I think will strengthen your spine in your fight against sexual temptation. So if you're, if you're listening or watching, the, here it is uh, again, regardless of the, the situation, really for all the stories that we've told on here, it is the vulnerability of inviting others into um, what we're enduring in a given season that tends to strengthen and become this tangible experience of God's grace and closeness to us. I, it just so the the desire to hide when we're struggling is not just a thing. Oh, I'm a pastor. I've got to try to look together. My wife's a pastor's wife. She's got to look like we're all together here. This is like a really, it's a thing that we're all doing if we're not careful. And hopefully that over the last three seasons, one of the things I hope is happening to you is you're learning that that this is a part of life in a fallen world, that God is with us in the mess. And the mess isn't an accusation against our worth or value or strength or togetherness. It's really a testimony of Jesus's grace to be with us regardless of the season. And and that's what you're hearing here in Max's story with his wife, that, that she could have like, smiled back at joy and, you know, you did the spirit sprinkle thing and been like, praise the Lord, sister, you know, live in the dream. And, and that would have taken her deeper into despair, mm -hmm. but, but she made a choice in that moment. And I'm sure it wasn't an easy one. I'm sure there was a compulsion there to play the part. Uh, but instead of playing the part, she was honest. And now here all these years later, she's pointing to that moment as a turning point for her and then joy's response with such grace to go, you tell everybody that it freed her up to walk in the light and there's healing, healing, healing and hope in the light. And so I, I just wanted to comment on that aspect of the story because I think it's so huge for anyone enduring really any season, regardless of what it is, whether it's depression or sickness or loss of a child or friend or betrayal at some level or you, you name it, we need to invite others in. We have not been designed to do this on our own, but but to do it with each other. And so I wanted to speak to that. Um, so you, she comes out of this, you guys kind of come out of this and then following that, was there a, was there a good period that I would just describe maybe as peacetime for mm -hmm. a while before the next wave came? Can, can you speak to maybe that, that period of peacetime and then maybe what the next wave was as you're leading and preaching and pastoring yeah. this church? I, I, I think it, what I, what I, um, the the kind of the bumper sticker lesson that that I learned in that is succeed at home first. Amen. Succeed at home first. I was succeeding elsewhere first, but not at home. And uh, so I'm very grateful to Jesus for giving me a second chance. Um, and we did. We we worked on it. We worked on it. And and she became. I mentioned that the elders became my accountability group, but also yeah. she was a part of that group. That's good. And, um, and so I never left home unless, unless I had, uh, her blessing, unless she felt, uh, you know, really, really strong about it. Um, I think the, um, uh, challenge, the, the root challenge that comes out of that, Matt, is this lifelong struggle that I have had with pleasing people. I, I have an addiction to approval, and uh, I feel like my job is to make you like me, and that's the root I'm trying to deal with. Yeah. Uh, every when I preach, I, 
I would love someday, Matt, to preach a sermon absolutely oblivious to what people think about me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? I I can't. I've I've, I've just not gotten there. Sometimes yeah. I feel like all I care about is am I impressing these people, and that's pathetic. It's beautiful to, that God could use. Yeah. At writing books, you know, writing books, I, I, I catch myself thinking, oh, when this book comes out, people are going to say all those nice things about Max. <laughs> Why do I do that? You know, why do I do that? It's not about me and it's not about now. So that has been my, if I were to trace all my struggles back to it's that addiction to adulation, you mm-hmm. know, that I love the approval of people. And our Lord Jesus was straightforward with those Pharisees. You know, he, he said, really you was. love the approval of man. You love the approval of man. You stand on the street corner and you say those loud prayers to be heard. by. And I, oh, man, that's me. Come on. So here I am, almost 70, still struggling with that. And I would just beseech your prayers. Maybe uh, the Lord will deliver me from that and give me s- several good years. of <laughs> Yeah. Pure, pure, pure ministry. But even if he doesn't, you know, he's going to use us uh, yeah. regardless. And uh, for that, I'm thankful beyond words. Well, thank you for that, because no one listening, um, I, I don't think anybody listening wouldn't resonate with that. And even what I found is the guys that are like, I don't care what anybody thinks especially cares what people think. Um, and so there is a there, there is a compulsion in all of us. Um, nobody wants to not be liked or to be harshly right. critiqued or we, what we can't have is people indifferent to us. Um, that can feel like death. Here's my guess. My guess is that Max Lucado at almost 70, it, surely there's some vestiges of it, but 70 year old Max Lucado isn't wrestling with it quite like 32 year old Max Lucado was wrestling with it. And so can you speak to maybe how the Lord has confronted, engaged, chipped away, rebuked, disciplined uh, across the last couple of decades to free you up a little bit more? Um, in this area, if not outright heal, which you're saying, no, I'm not, I don't, I don't have that yet, but, but could you speak to maybe growth in this area and how the Lord's accomplished that growth? Um, yes, I sure can. And, and the image that comes to my mind as you're asking the question is, uh, I, you know, I mentioned that I was really a disciple of Coors before Christ. Yeah. That's kind of a <laughs> bad way of saying it, but I was. And uh, I come from a family of alcohol alcoholism. Uh, my brother battled alcoholism his whole life. Uh, my dad was a teetotaler because his father was an alcoholic. So okay. it, it, to whatever degree it is a disease, it's in my family tree. And, um, and so I've had to watch that. And, and there was a stretch there in, uh, I would say, between 2002 and 2005 in which um, – I uh, tumbled over into a practice of secret drinking as a way of anesthetizing. That's always been a hard word for me. As a way of numbing at yeah. uh, the, the end of the day, uh, the stress. I, I, I'm not a teetotaler. I'd love a good glass of wine. Yeah. I, I love a good beer. But I, I have to be super careful, Matt, because I will use that alcohol to take the edge off if I'm under stress. Yeah. And so w- what was bad about that period of time is that I was uh, doing it so secretively. Um, on the outside, again, the church looked great. I was rocking and rolling. Everything was smooth. And, and, and my marriage was healthy, and the kids yeah. were good. They were all teenagers by this point. But I started uh, driving over to a certain convenience store, um, not all the way on the other side of San Antonio, but certainly out of the area in which most of our church members attended. And I would buy one of those big cans of beer that they have in those ice chests, and, and I would sit out in my car and I would drink it. That's not a real happy memory for me. Yeah. And, and I didn't do it every day, but I did it two or three times a week. And to think, uh, here Locato is driving where he can be un- not recognized, which yeah. probably wasn't smart anyway. I probably was recognized. And buying a beer and putting it in a brown paper bag and kind of putting it down by my thigh so yeah. I would walk out and people couldn't see it, sit in my car and 
popped the top and, and guzzled the beer for the whole purpose of just kind of rewarding myself either that or taking the stress off at the, at the end of the day. Uh, that to me was a, a Jacob at Jabbok experience okay. for me. And, um, I, um, as close as I've ever been to hearing the audible voice of God, uh, on one of those occasions, there was this message. What in the world are you doing? Yeah. What in the world are you doing? And what I just, it, it's what kill, what, what strikes me, Matt, is that it was all so gradual, you know, yeah. just a little here, a little more, a little here, a little more. And I was doing the very thing that I, I would tell people not to do. Yeah. And so I just, I thought, how in the world did I get to this point? Now, what I did next was good, and I urge people to do it. Again, I went back to my elders. I've had pretty much the same elders all these years. I went to them, and we had a Wednesday night elders meeting. I That was on a Wednesday when I felt heard, heard the Lord. I went straight to that Wednesday night elders meeting, and I said, uh, Brothers, uh, your pastor's drinking. Your pastor's drinking. And uh, they, of course, they were, they didn't quite, they were thought we were going to meet and talk about budget. And here yeah. they're talking about their pastor. <laughs> they were so good to me, Matt. Yeah. They were so good. They rallied around me. They said the same, some of the same guys who had helped me, you know, 15 years earlier, they said, how can we help you? How can we support you? What can we do? And, um, and one of them who has now gone to heaven, Jim Potts, came over and said, you know, you're sinning, Max. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. I kind of <laughs> needed to hear that. Yeah. You know you're sinning, so repent. To come back to Christ. Well, you don't say that to your pastor, right? But that's what I needed to hear. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was good for me. It was good for me. So once again, I had just uh, – all the stress had come in, and I was mismanaging it. I wasn't managing it correctly. And it led me right out there on the edge where I could have made three or four more decisions that would have taken me over the edge. Yeah. But by God's grace, you know, uh, there's the vulnerability. I came back to the elders, and that turned out to be a great decision. Yeah. And um, it found like I kind of got myself back on track. I, I would love to hear from you personally. I mean, I know other people are going to be watching this. Um, but when I think about I was literally having this conversation about two hours ago with one of our elders, another lead pastor at the church with me, where I run at a certain pace. Um, and when I miss something or make a mistake, it's almost always because of the speed at which I'm operating. And um, I... I, I would love to glean from you and for anybody listening who's, you know, they, they have a high pressure job and they've got a lot going on at home and they probably these days, if they're younger, have a side hustle too. And like if you could coach us or father us on what to do when we're feeling that. And I know it's a hard question because I think a lot of times we don't even know that's what we're feeling. Um, but where to take that something's not right. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm not sure I can identify it, but I, I can see, I mean, that one drinks turning into three drinks or that one scoop of ice creams turned into a half gallon or that nap has turned into staying in bed all day or that, that, you know, that scrolling on Instagram has turned into pornography or can you speak to maybe how we can spot that a little bit earlier and, and where to take that rather than give in to those compulsions where yours is to grab a giant beer and stay in your car. Um, my, mine would be something different. I'm sure other people would be like, no, nah, my compulsion goes this way. It, could you, and maybe you can't, maybe it's the grace mm -hmm. of God. Um, but if you could coach us a little on when you're yeah. feeling overwhelmed, outclassed in over your head, like you're not going to make it where to take that in a way that's real practical and helpful in my life, when I'm mismanaging stress, uh, is when I, a, a clue that I'm mismanaging stress is when I'm doing things secretly. Yeah. 
That's a good word. When, when I'm when I'm uh, covering things up, uh, when I am um, uh, kind of, uh, I can I can do this at, by God's grace. To be right now, I don't battle treating my stress with alcohol. Right yeah. now, that's not a temptation or struggle to me, but I do struggle back on the people pleasing thing with with kind of dropping names or or a, appearing to inflate okay uh success and so when i when I catch myself, you know, hey, I happened to visit with so and so recently uh maybe a guy I know who plays on the p g a or n b a you know I tell you I was with so and so that day and when i when I catch myself saying that for really no other reason except to impress the person with whom I'm having a conversation. Yeah. then basically I'm managing the insecurity I feel toward the person with whom I'm having the conversation. I'm trying to manage that by inflating myself. Yeah. Does, it, does that make sense? Oh, perfect sense. And so either either I'm inflating or I'm doing something secretive. Uh, I don't want to get caught. I don't want anybody to see me. And so I, I buy the beer and 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 I do it in a part of the city, which is just so bizarre. I look yeah. back on it; it's so adolescent, just so adolescent. <laughs> but hey, yeah. Um, but but and so it, what they might have in common is that I'm not managing the insecurity that I feel uh, in a in an appropriate manner. And so I think it would help if a, every person. Uh, uh, tried to identify how they inappropriately manage stress and and maybe write down the two or three ways that they do so or maybe get their spouse to help them. Yeah. Say, when you see me in a mismanaging stress, what am I doing? How am I doing it? For some of us, it might be like I was doing in my early 30s, saying yes to everything because you don't have to manage stress as long as everybody telling you how great you are, correct? Yeah. <laughs> and so – um that that might be a practical takeaway, Matt. What do you think? Just yeah, what, no, what, I, do, what are the your no, ways I, of mismanaging stress? I I think if you can see it, you've got a shot. It's ah, when you're you, you can't see it, and you're not yeah. even aware that that third yeah. drink is a problem. That that's when you like the two or three times you bought the beer on the other side of town, and we're hiding it by your thigh and we're drinking it in your car. If you're not aware. And and so I think there has to be a sense of uh, search me and know me, oh God. So if you're listening to this, mm-hmm. I, I think a prayer of, are there areas I'm doing this right now that I don't know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, man, I'm always a big, the second I can see it, I've got three or four guys I'm bringing into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't. I don't think I've been called to fight a single battle by myself. Amen. Um, and so me and my guys, we've got this shield to shield kind of idea where we're in this together. We're going to finish well together. We're going to walk alongside of each other, come hell or high water and both hell and high water have come more than once. Absolutely. And, and that fabric's held. So I've got a group of men in my life that are standing ready to fight for me and with me. And, and so in those moments where either Lauren, my wife makes me aware of something I'm not seeing or someone else makes me aware of something I'm not seeing, or the Holy spirit asks me that question, you know, what are you doing? Um, I want to be very quick to not believe what anybody thinks about me or what, what they like about how God's gifted me or what I've accomplished. And instead I'm going to go to these men who know me. Who, who don't know anything about Matt Chandler, but they do know me and, and they're going to come alongside of me and they're going to walk with me and they're going to pick up their shields and get them around me. And they're going to walk with me until we're on the other side of it, until the Lord is, is got me to a place where I not only see it, but I, I no longer, the compulsion's given way to something else. Uh, and so I think seeing it and then inviting others into it is where the secret sauce is. In your case, is this an identifiable group like the four of you know you're all in this very, together? Very much so. Okay. Very much so. There are four men uh, that I've been walking with, most of whom um, close to 15 years, one over 20 years, uh, another guy that, I mean, entered into that group a couple of years ago and very quickly just became one of us. It, it was the 
fastest I've ever seen just a friend become family yeah. in in my nearly 50 years of life. And so we've got a little text thread. We uh, frequently, uh, in fact, daily are interacting. Our wives are friends. Our mm. lives overlap. There's a great deal of proximity. And um, by the grace of God, um, we've had open conversation about our desires to finish well. Uh, yeah. to spot the schemes of the enemy and to meet them head on with the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so I'm not the only one leaning into this group. The group leans into the group. Mm. Um, and so I oftentimes worry about pastors in particular who haven't either don't feel safe enough to create that kind of community or haven't given the time and energy to over time build it, they, they really have isolated themselves in a way that I think is very dangerous. Um, and I think men in general kind of stink at this. I think in general, they just kind of stink at this. They've got buddies that they watch games with, or they have hobbies with, or maybe they go out and golf with. Um, but a more below the line that, that's what we would call it, a below-the-line friendship based on the things that are going on in our hearts and in our hopes and in our fears is the thing that I've tried to cultivate with these men and they've wanted to cultivate with me. And we've been, I've already, I mean, we've, we've been through hell and high water and the fabric has held. In fact, it's like a, um, it's like a Turkish rug. It actually got stronger <laughs> for the, the wear. And uh, I would I would just want people to not only be able to spot it either by the grace of God, what are you doing, son, or by a friend who has the courage or a wife or husband who has the courage to go, babe, this this looks like it's an issue. And then instead of kind of powering up to explain mm -hmm. it away, mm -hmm. receiving it and beginning to ask the Holy Spirit if this is if this is an area that the Lord wants to work and then very quickly bring in others to help. Um, and, and I have found now 32 years into following Jesus, 20 years in trying to develop those kind of relationships that I, I feel safer right now than I ever have in my life in regards to the schemes of the enemy against me and whether I'm known or not. Like I... Like, I, I just feel like it, you'd be hard pressed to make me nervous by telling me, hey, guess what I found out about you? I'm mm -hmm. Like, here's maybe you found out something, but I've got four guys over here. It ain't going to be news to them. Uh, I've got a wife. It ain't going to be news to her. And, and so to be 100% known um, it is, is the safest place on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to strive for that. Imperfectly, of course, but I want to strive for that. Do you have regular times that you get together? How do you yeah. how do you keep the oil flowing through the machinery the, there? The good news is they all four of them work at the church, and we all four are in very close proximity in regards okay. to our responsibility at the village, and okay. and so these guys are on staff. They're all staff elders. Um, and, and we have vacationed together. We have celebrated kids' birthdays together. We have, uh, I mean, some of them as far back as at the hospital for the birth of their children kind of stuff. Uh, we're at each other's children's events where it's just become that kind of community. We have a once a quarter, we call it a business meeting where we all get together and play and plan things. And so we, we have spent energy and resources cultivating uh, the relationship that we have. That's such a good example. That's well, such a good word. I, I think it's available to anybody who wants it. In fact, I oftentimes tell pastors, don't choose to be lonely. Mm. Don't choose to be lonely. Choose to take some well thought out risks to, to be vulnerable and to grow with people who show themselves to be trustworthy. Now, I'm not telling you to just snatch up a guy real quick and just dump it all on him. That could go real bad for you. 
but over a period of time, cultivate intimacy and vulnerability with other brothers or other sisters. And I, and I think this goes not just across pastoral ministry, but about all through Christian life, um, that there should be something deeper we're working towards as overcomers. It really has to be a decision too, doesn't it? It is. Because there's always, always more work that we can use always. as an excuse. Yeah. Uh, there's always more uh, calendar conflicts that we can use as a dis- as an excuse. I get the impression you guys have really made this a priority and have it it, very it much worked is. your world and worked your lives around it. For sure. It's the only way it'll yeah. work. Yeah. Hey, here's how I'd love to kind of close out our time, Max. Um, y- most people listening to this are, are not 70, um, but we're all, by the grace of God, heading there if he has those days for us. If you were to speak to overcoming the the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows of life, give us a nugget of wisdom or or something to consider as we navigate kind of the long journey home. Well, God's greatest idea is grace. That's it for me. I mean, this it's God's greatest idea. The 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 relationship that we have with Jesus is so different than any other philosophy or religion in the history of the world. Every, every other religion or philosophy says, do this and hope God cares. Yeah. Uh, our faith says God cares and he did it for you. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's the core. Let's, let's build our lives around that great grace. Let God love you. Let God forgive you and let God use you. You know, I'm so excited again about what, what is to come. A lot of the guys my age, uh, and like I said earlier, they're kind of dreading death. They're, they're, they're postponing it. They're doing everything they can. And um, I'm, I'm just so thankful that the Lord has gotten me excited about, come on. about what is going to happen, what's going to happen. Again, not to be dogmatic about it. We should just yeah. be curious about it. Yeah. And so my advice to a 50-year-old version of Max is get excited about the next life. Uh, let this life, let the brevity of it pass. Let the eternity of it matter. Um, I think uh, somebody, oh, is Greg Laurie? I wasn't dropping a name there. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just talking with him uh, in another interview, and he said that, that uh, what surprises him about life is the brevity of it. Fast. Just the brevity. And that is really true. It, it really is. does race fast. Our kids grow up fast. Yep. Life races fast. But it's going to be awesome when it we is. all get home. Amen. Amen to that. Hey, thank you for your time. Thank you for just hanging with me this afternoon. It's been great. Uh, I'm the one who's benefited the most. Well, I, really I don't know. Have. All right, brother. All right, well, brother. God's blessings on you. All the best. Talk uh-huh. to you soon. Take care. Yep. Man, I turned 50 this June. I've been following Jesus for 30 years. I've been pastoring for close to 25. And I I feel as committed as ever to the cause of Christ in this day and you being equipped and empowered to follow him as an overcomer in this moment of history that God's put us in. And and so one of the things that I've done uh, moving into the second season of my life is I created the website, pastormattchandler.com. There's all sorts of resources there. There's a monthly newsletter for those who are in ministry uh, and then those who are just following Jesus uh, day in and day out as as a lay person. And then, uh, man, I, I, I wrote the book, The Overcomers, as kind of a, uh, just kind of a push of like, we can do this in this moment. We can love and with the compassion of Christ, push back darkness and see order established in the chaos of our day. In fact, it's what God wants to accomplish in and through us in this moment of history. And so uh, head to pastormattchandler.com. You can find those resources there. Sign up for that newsletter. You can even buy the book, The Overcomers, right now. If you haven't had a chance to read it just yet, I think it will encourage your soul.